I know the story I'm about to tell might seem like it's made up, and many people question if it really happened, but I promise you that everyone involved saw what went down that strange night. This happened 11 years ago with an ex-girlfriend and it totally changed our relationship, leading to a breakup a few weeks later. Even now, I remember it clearly because it was so hard to explain. My girlfriend at that time planned a surprise overnight trip, and I felt really lucky and touched by how much effort she put into it. After packing a bag with clothes and stuff, we set off, thinking we were going to a hotel or resort. After two and a half hours, we turned off the main road onto a rough path, and I wondered if we were going camping. She said we were, which was a bit disappointing since I wasn't a fan of camping and hadn't brought hiking shoes, but I still appreciated the effort. After an hour on the bumpy road, we reached a campground. I noticed we were completely alone, which made sense given how far off the main road we were. I was surprised her car made it that far given how rough the road was. We set up a fire pit, made dinner, and had a good time. When night came, we went to the tent, expecting a normal camping experience for college students. Then, something strange happened. I heard a scratching noise on the side of the tent. At first, I thought it might be the wind moving branches or maybe a bird, but the noise stopped and we went back to what we were doing. Suddenly, everything went completely silent and we both felt uneasy. Our playful mood vanished. We tried to listen for any animal sounds, but instead, something hit the tent hard, like a log being thrown against it. The tent material was pushed inward and I felt a rush of adrenaline. I quickly grabbed a knife and a flashlight, ready to face whatever was outside. I jumped out of the tent, expecting to confront someone with a weapon. I looked around, but all I saw was darkness and silence. It seemed like nothing had disturbed the ground where the noise had come from. I called out, but there was no answer. I felt a chill and told my girlfriend to grab the keys and get out of the tent. We rushed to the car which was about 30 yards away from the path. We were both scared, and my girlfriend started the car without asking questions. The walk to the car felt like forever. Once we were inside, I started the engine, locked the doors, and turned on the headlights. We sat for a few seconds trying to figure out what had happened. My girlfriend noticed that her laptop, which she had used as a lantern, was moving inside the tent. We had left in a hurry, and the items were scattered about 30 yards away. I quickly put the car in gear and drove down the rough path. While driving, we heard a loud, piercing noise that seemed to come from inside the car. I turned the radio on and off, checked the windows, and asked my girlfriend if her car had ever made such a noise. She said no and agreed that she heard it too. The sound was like a constant ringing bell unlike anything we had ever heard before. It went on for about 10 minutes before suddenly stopping. Relieved, we continued driving and finally stopped at a truck stop diner where we spent the night in the parking lot. My girlfriend managed to sleep, but I stayed on edge from the adrenaline and fear. The next day, we went back to the campsite at sunrise to check things out. Although the tent's contents were scattered, nothing was missing. I hoped it was just some pranksters, but there was no sign of anyone. We packed up quickly and left since the area still felt creepy. I haven't gone camping since then. If I do go again, it will be in an RV or at a more familiar place with other people around. This all happened in the remote mountains near Payson, Arizona, far from any town. My story takes place in northern Italy in 2013. It was early September when a friend of mine suggested a short hike in the woods near his town. I of course agreed I love hiking in nature. We prepared our backpacks, grabbed some food, and drove out to the location. My friend knew the area very well, so we didn't take a map or flashlights. We didn't plan on staying out too late. As we ventured deeper into the woods, we passed a few beautiful spots. A small river, a pair of caves that we explored, 
and then we had lunch. We continued following a trail deeper into the forest. After about half an hour, we arrived at a fairly large clearing, and that's when things took a turn. In the clearing were a group of people, about four or five, dressed normally. They were just talking and laughing. There was no sign of a cult or any dreadful chants or rituals, just ordinary people like my friend and me, chatting with one another. They saw us too, as the clearing had no trees or rocks to obscure the view. We couldn't avoid them, so we approached and said, Hey there, what's up? No one responded. They just stared at us in silence. This immediately raised a red flag for both of us. We stopped and looked at each other, concerned. We tried again. Hey! Still no response. Feeling increasingly uneasy, we decided to turn back and head to our car. Shortly after we turned around, we realized they were following us. I turned and asked, Hey! Did we do something wrong? Again, no answer, but they continued to follow. We walked faster, trying to get off the trail as quickly as possible. They kept pace, staying about 15 meters behind us. Panicking, we decided to run. As soon as we did, they started running too. We were terrified and did our best to put distance between them and us. We were still 40 minutes away from the car, deep in the woods and felt completely helpless. About halfway back, we noticed they were no longer behind us. I hoped we had managed to lose them. We hid behind a thick bush and listened for any sounds. Silence. No footsteps. No voices. After catching our breath, we carefully made our way back to the car, trying to stay as quiet as possible. We jumped in and drove away quickly. But the story didn't end there. Once we left the woods and reached the main road, we saw another car emerging from a secondary road behind us. It was them following us again. At that moment, we had no confirmation, but the car was tailgating us, staying close the entire time. That area is very rarely visited, with almost no cars except for ours and that one. The car didn't have license plates. We drove to my friend's town, avoiding his house and taking every country road we could think of. Every turn we made, they made as well. As we reached the town, we made a U-turn and headed back toward the woods. Terrified, we informed the local police about what had happened and asked them to check the area. But as far as we know, no evidence was found, and we never heard back from them. We never saw those people again. But in the days that followed, we were extremely paranoid and didn't even want to leave our homes. This experience was so unsettling that I took a break from hiking for about four years. I still have no idea who those people were, what they wanted, or why they followed us. The whole ordeal was horrifying and gave me PTSD. I hope we never see them again. I work as a child professional, and one of the kids I look after had recently gotten into hiking. I decided to take him to a really cool trail at Rock Creek State Park. We were all set to hike Beacon Trail. After parking right near the trailhead, the entrance trail, which is about half a mile, was why I chose this trail for our hike that day. I selected this trail because, in the past, it had always been busy and popular, which made me feel secure. However, this past summer, we experienced severe storms that caused massive damage to the trail. To my surprise, it was now much more difficult and completely empty. I wasn't bothered by the emptiness since a small construction crew was working on a bridge barely visible from the trailhead. Despite the trail being washed out to a width of no more than a foot, with a 6 to 12 foot deep drop off into the creek bed, he was excited for the hike. He is very athletic and I was confident in his abilities. We made it to a platform that offered a view of the entire cave. There were many downed trees around the platform. It was actually closed at this point, but since we had made it this far, we decided to continue to the platform and proceed a few hundred feet into the cave. We spent most of our time in this area due to the difficulty. The cave was not a creepy enclosed space but more like a cliff with an overhanging rock formation and a small waterfall in the middle. 
It was very open and beautiful. As we entered the cave, I noticed a candle that had recently been used, sitting on a large rock with a heart carved into it. I assumed it was from a date or something similar and ignored it. He wanted to climb to the top, where I saw two more candles and three stacks of small rocks. Although I felt uneasy, I dismissed it. Later, he found a small puddle full of baby salamanders and wanted to catch them. It was the happiest I had seen him in a long time, and I didn't have the heart to tell him it was time to leave. We spent about an hour catching salamanders, and I watched him have the time of his life. I decided it was time to go. When we returned to the platform, I noticed a wet washcloth hanging dead center in the middle of the tree roots, which was absolutely not there before. He noticed it too, but didn't grasp the situation's severity. At that moment, I realized two things. Someone was watching us. Though we didn't see them, they saw us. And they were likely hiding in the woods, making sure not to be seen but leaving something for us to notice. There was no turning back to the narrow trail, and I wasn't about to tell him we might be in danger. I told him to go in front of me and kept encouraging him, which naturally sped him up. Although I never saw anyone on the trail, we finally got back to the car, and I locked the doors immediately. On our way out of the park, a dirty man in his 30s emerged from the woods and stared at me with the emptiest expression I've ever seen. He followed me with his eyes and head as I drove past, continuing to stare until he was out of sight in the rearview mirror. His face and that stare haunted me for days. I considered counseling after this incident as it caused me severe anxiety for weeks. I tried to convince myself that maybe we just interrupted his bath time and he was camping and didn't want to startle us. After all, he had ample time to do anything he wanted while we were catching salamanders. I just cannot rationalize why he stared at me the way he did. The kid I took hiking still has no idea how panicked I was. To this day, it remains the most fun I've ever seen him have, and he still talks about it regularly. For him, it was a very positive experience, but for me, it was one of my worst experiences ever. I still feel disturbed even writing this. I'm not sure if this is the right place to share this, but I've kept this story to myself for six years because it sounds pretty unbelievable. I've been told many times not to talk about it. Six years ago, I went camping with an ex-boyfriend. The campsite we picked was beautiful. We drove in through some rough roads. Our spot was close to hiking trails, not far from natural hot springs and a big waterfall. We were completely alone with no one else around. We set up our camp next to the car, went hiking and enjoyed the hot springs. After coming back, we had dinner and everything seemed fine. But when we woke up the next morning, things were weird. Before going to bed, I put our food cooler and stereo in the car and locked it. I put the keys in the front pocket of my backpack and placed the backpack next to my sleeping bag, away from the door of the tent. My boyfriend slept closest to the door with a gun beside him. When we woke up, I felt okay, though I had slept pretty deeply. From inside the tent, everything seemed normal. But when we stepped outside, our campsite was a mess. The fire pit was ruined, the cooler was thrown around, and the food was scattered everywhere. My stereo was broken next to a tree, and all the car doors, including the trunk, were open. We stood there in shock, trying to understand what had happened. The woods, which had been so nice the day before, now felt creepy and wrong. My ex immediately blamed me for not locking the car properly, saying an animal must have gotten into our stuff. I told him I had locked it and went to get the keys from my backpack. They weren't there. I eventually found them on the ground near the car. We quickly packed everything into the trunk and left. My boyfriend stayed quiet and wouldn't talk about what happened. Later on, he told me on the way home that he had dreamed of something kneeling over him in the tent, holding his gun and just staring at him. He didn't want to talk about it anymore and told me not to mention it to anyone else either. I've tried to put it behind me, 
but I can't shake the feeling that something really strange happened in those woods that night. A few years back, in the summer before my junior year of high school, I went to a sleepover camp like usual. This time, though, it was different. Instead of staying at the campgrounds, we were going to hike the Appalachian Trail for two weeks. I was really excited about this new adventure because I love exploring. On this trip, it was me, the two female counselors, and nine other girls. A few days into our hike, we stopped for lunch at a water fountain along the trail, which was near a road. While eating, we noticed a sketchy van driving up and down the same stretch of road. We didn't say much, but kept an eye on it. After a while, the van parked close to where we were and just stayed there. We thought the driver might be lost or looking for a bathroom, so we didn't think much of it. Suddenly, a man got out of the van and ran up to us, shouting, Does anyone know CPR? My half-brother is having a seizure. Our counselors ran to his van and were gone for a few minutes, which made us start to worry. Some of us wondered why the man mentioned his half-brother and why he had driven by so many times if it was an emergency. When the counselors came back, they looked troubled and wouldn't answer our questions. The man approached us with some creepy plastic figures, like Halloween decorations, but without any candy. He started asking us questions, but we stayed silent, eating our lunch. In a weird way, he said, my puppet likes girls and mentioned that the puppet could talk if we pressed a button on its foot. He eventually got the hint and went back to his van, where he sat with his door open, blasting music until he finally drove off. We packed up and left quickly. It wasn't scary, but it was just the start of some strange events that day. As we kept hiking the Appalachian Trail, we talked about the odd encounter and shared scary stories until we reached our campsite. We set up our tents and still had plenty of daylight. Bored, we wandered around the campsite and flirted with a group of boys until they left. We then decided to play a game called Elephants and Gazelles, which is more fun with a large group. Three new guys came over to us, different from the ones we had flirted with before, and they seemed friendly. One of the girls invited them to join our game. During breaks, we shared personal stories and got to know each other better. Out of nowhere, one of the guys revealed that two of them were trans. I'm open-minded about gender identity, but it was odd that they brought this up without any context. They then told us they were trying to start a reality show about three trans men living in New York, with the third guy pretending to be trans on the show. It seems strange that they mentioned this so suddenly. Later, they laughed among themselves and one of them shouted, that's funny because your dad is in jail, making everyone uncomfortable. To break the tension, one of the girls told the story about the creepy puppet man we had met earlier. The guys laughed and said that the puppet man was their uncle who had dropped them off. Eventually, they said they were tired and went to their tent for the night. We were relieved and continued with our evening activities. Later, when a few girls went to the bathroom, they heard the guys singing Justin Timberlake songs and one of them yelling, tickle fight. It rained heavily that night and the next morning the guy's tent was gone. We were surprised because we usually woke up around sunrise. Before we left the campsite, I found a folded piece of paper on a stump near our tent. It read, we got rained on and wet our pants. We will miss you all. Love the creepy guys who get no respect. I'm still not sure what was stranger, their odd behavior or their link to the creepy puppet guy. Last year, I went hiking in Shenandoah, Virginia. It was supposed to be a day trip for me and two friends. Late on the first day, one of my friends got sick and decided to go back. The second friend went with him to help out while they told me to keep going alone. Since I had been really excited about the hike, I chose to continue. As evening came, 
I found a clearing in the forest with a table full of tools and several cans of spray paint. On the table was a big, fancy dollhouse about three feet tall. Its walls and windows were open, like it had just been painted and was still drying. The strong smell of spray paint hung in the air around it. On the back of the dollhouse, there was a photo of a family, probably from the 80s. The people in the photo looked very uncomfortable, as if they were forced to be there, rather than being scared. I left the dollhouse and went on to my planned campsite before dark. The wind had picked up a lot, and I heard a branch snap and fall, which startled me. I found my campsite, but the dollhouse made me uneasy. I realized I didn't want to camp out in the open where someone might find me. I had a small, one-person tent, just big enough for me to lie down in. I set it up behind some thick bushes, with one side protected by a tall rock formation. This was perfect because the rocks blocked the cold wind blowing down from the mountains. The wind rustling through the forest was calming, and I quickly fell asleep. Later, I woke up suddenly to a loud noise. It was a sound I couldn't quite place, but it stayed in my mind after I woke up. I felt like someone was nearby and listened carefully over the wind. I heard a man's voice in the distance, starting out harsh and quick, then getting softer. It was too far away for me to understand what he was saying, but it sounded like someone was scolding himself with a tone that made it seem like he wasn't all there mentally. As the voice got closer, I could hear heavy footsteps approaching. He walked past my campsite, just a few feet from the bushes hiding me. In the faint moonlight, I could only see a large, heavy-set figure, probably around six feet six inches tall. He was carrying something long under his arm, which I guessed was a rolled-up tent. He spoke angrily about someone's face and how it haunted him. Then his voice turned childish, and he started talking about cheese and crackers. Clearly, he wasn't in his right mind. After a while, his voice faded as he moved away, and I couldn't hear him anymore. I hardly slept that night and left as soon as it was light. When I passed the clearing again, the dollhouse was gone. About nine months ago, my partner and I had just gotten a six-month-old boxer puppy to keep our three-year-old Labrador company. We thought it would be nice to take them for a walk in the countryside. We live near a big city called Halton in northeastern England, so we decided to explore an area north of the River Humber, which flows into the sea. When we reached a village close to a local landmark, an Old World War II army fort, we decided to stroll through some nearby patches of forest near a nature reserve. As we walked along a grassy path towards the forest, my partner pointed out two young men who had started walking up the hill from the woods, coming towards us at an angle, as if they were trying to cut us off. I wondered if they were part of a World War II reenactment because they were dressed in camouflage pants and were covered in dirt. At first, I thought they would just pass us by, but as they got closer, it seemed like they were intentionally heading towards us. When they were about 10 feet away, they stopped and one of them spoke. The way he spoke made me uneasy, as he seemed to ignore politeness and made no sense. He asked where we were planning to walk, and we told him we weren't sure and would just see where we ended up. He seemed disappointed and suggested we follow his route, which went through the forest to a place he said was great for sightseeing and relaxing with benches to sit on. While he talked, the other young man kept a close eye on our dogs, making sure they were always in his view. Not knowing the area well and having seen no other dog walkers, we decided to take his advice. They pointed us to an opening in the woods, and we went into the forest. The trees blocked about 30% of the sunlight, and as I looked back, I saw that the young man was still standing there, watching us enter the woods. The path seemed to be man-made, as it was the only clear route through the forest. A couple of minutes into our walk, our Labrador started sniffing around a bush, which didn't seem unusual since both dogs liked to sniff everything. But she began sniffing and rolling on the ground in one spot. 
We went over and found she was sniffing a broken rubber pig mask with brownish red liquid on it. It was pretty gross, and my partner moved the dog away because flies were all over it. Further along, the woods became a narrow path surrounded by trees and bushes, with a turn visible ahead. We agreed that if the path led nowhere, we would turn back. I walked ahead, taking out my phone to take a photo of the scenery, when I felt several small pricks on my neck, chin, and part of my face. I gasped to alert my partner, who told me to stay still and carefully removed thin pieces of string from my face. It turned out that someone had strung fishing hooks on lines to a tree in the path. We were both terrified, confused, and angry by this point. So we quickly headed back to the car and drove home. I don't want to sound overly dramatic, but as we drove away, I could have sworn I saw something in the rearview mirror, peeking out at the road.